Yeah. All right. Acts chapter 28. I believe I have four more messages, two more Sundays in the book of Acts. And um, if you've been with us for the last six weeks, it seems like we've been in a storm. And uh, I'm not speaking about the virus, nor am I speaking about the, the rioting and protesting and all that. I'm talking about a storm in the Bible. We finally, we got out of that storm, landed on an island called Malita, which today is modern-day Malta. And barbarians are there. They're not barbarians necessarily because of their wildness, but because they are not part of Rome. They are not people that speak the same culture, same language. Verse number 1 of chapter 28, just to read what we saw last Sunday, it says, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, that 276 souls escaped the storm, escaped the ship, they escaped the sea, and they all are on shore. Verse 2, And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came out a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. People are fickle, aren't they? From a murderer to a God. Verse 7, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. I'm going to stop there. And in what we've seen in the last several weeks is this band of men, these prisoners, soldiers, sailors, these preachers, Paul and Luke and Aristarchus, on this ship in the storm. And they have lived with each other in that condition now for at least 14 days, perhaps longer. There are all kinds of speculation of how long they were actually in this storm. But now they're, they're on the shore. They made it to the island of Melita. They're on the shore, and these barbarians are being kind to them. And in my mind, what happens is the whole narrative sort of changes, especially in the verses that I want to look at this morning, verses 7 through 10. They go from being in a storm with the same people, isolated, no sun, no stars, no moon, no hope. And they're trying to make it on the boat that they're in. And now they're on the shore and things change. And now Paul, Paul and these men are with this multitude of people. And if you look what he says, the Bible speaks about there, and, and I couldn't get away from that word in verse number 9, so when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. There's this great multitude that is gathered around these men that just escaped the shipwreck and the storm. They're on the shore and they gather sticks and they build a fire and they take and they try to comfort them. And in my mind, I see all of these people lined on the shore and, and they see these men as they come straggling in. And, and then we see this man's father who gets healed and now word goes out into the island and there's this multitude of people that become, and this, this coastline, they say it's, St. Paul's Bay on the island of Malta is where we're reading. That's what they say. That this little bay, it begins to fill up with people, multitudes. And when I thought about that, it reminded me of the Lord Jesus Christ 
And you know, right now there are multitudes in our country. And they're gathered for different reasons. I'm not going to speculate on those things. But when I read the Bible, I also see that Jesus had multitudes that followed him. There were multitudes that wanted to be healed. There were multitudes that had needs that they wanted met by the only one that could meet their need. And, and you know what? I, I'd like to say this this morning. I'm part of Tabernacle Baptist Church. I'm thankful to be part of a bunch of folks that believe the Bible and that love Jesus and have a view for eternal things. But I'm telling you, I'm also glad I've got a Savior that's interested in the multitudes. There's a Savior in heaven that is interested in the multitudes. And Paul goes from ministering to these men on the ship now to ministering to a multitude of people, which is really reasonable. What we just heard saying, you know what, I am glad there is no condemnation. I'm glad that I don't have to worry about facing the judgment for my sins. I'm glad that Jesus took them. But isn't it reasonable if I can rejoice about that? Shouldn't I want to be able to give that same hope to countless hundreds of others that are outside that still have condemnation and judgment hanging over them? It's reasonable if I've been given that that freedom and that liberty to try to take and extend that. That's one of the reasons Tabernacle Baptist Church continues to send out missionaries because we believe that the world ought to hear about Jesus Christ. Ministering to the world. He's working with the multitudes. Now, I think it's unusual. Bear with me. I, I'm going to preach the Bible. I have nothing that I have taken and tried forethought to uh, bring us into this passage again. We're looking at multitudes, and we start off in verse 7, in the same quarters. Now, when you read that, that's like the French Quarter of New Orleans. It's a region. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. He's a chief man. He's a man that is of note. Now, it says his possessions are there. I don't know if they borrowed possessions from Publius and were helping these men that came ashore with the food and clothing and all that. What I do know is, though, that it mentions that he is a chief man. He's a chief man. And when you read that, I'm going to give you a few instances. In Acts 13, 50, there were chief men of the city. Who's the chief men in the city of Greenville, South Carolina? Would it be someone that owns a particularly large portion of real estate? Would he be a chief man? Certainly. Would it be someone that has a position of authority like the mayor or the councilman? Certainly. Would it be someone perhaps that has great reputation outside of Greenville? Perhaps there are chief men of the city. The Bible says in Acts 15, 22 that there were chief among the brethren. There are people of note among the brethren. That They are, they are chief. They are they are put forward as someone of unique notice. And it goes on to say that the chief ruler of the synagogue and the chief captain. Now, and here's what, we, we've looked at this chief captain in chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24. He's, he's somebody that is of note. And what I want you to see is that this man that is of note, this chief man, that God is interested in him, and that's why he's in the Bible. And I'm going to say that say this. Are you listening to me? This man is probably a chief man because of his possessions. You see in verse 7, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man. He's probably a wealthy man. He's probably a rich man. He's probably a man who had a nice fine house. He had nice facilities. He probably, had, he probably had either money that he'd been inherited, money he'd earned, money he'd been given, whatever it was. He had lots of possessions. And today, if you listen to the world, somebody that's wealthy, somebody that's rich, couldn't have earned it in any fashion that would have been honest. It must have been taken from others. And those people really are people that should be looked at as someone that is stealing from others, that someone that has taken advantage of the poverty in this world. And you know what I'd like to say about that? I'm just, are you listening? I'm telling you that God is interested in wealthy people. Yeah. Yeah. I know that flies counter to the rest of the world. But you know what, listen, most of you probably think your doctor is wealthy and your dentist is wealthy because the amount of money that we have to pay to have our teeth cleaned and to have our eyes checked, I mean, it costs a lot of money that you think they're wealthy. But you know what I think? I think your doctor and your dentist deserve an opportunity to hear the gospel just like anybody else. 
the chief man. The multitudes have a chief man in the middle of it. And this chief man looks like a good man. Look what the Bible says. I know that some people say, well, all these rich people, they're just, you know, they're just trying to uh, take advantage of others. Publius, the Bible says, who received us. He's a rich man, a cheap man, and he's receiving other people. Now think about that for a minute. Can you, can you tell me how many us's are there? Come on, think with me. How many souls were on the ship? 276. I'd say you'd be a pretty benevolent man you accept 276 people. Do you know what was on that boat, 276 people? Soldiers. Some people don't like soldiers. Prisoners. We don't know what kind of prisoners they were. Preachers. There's some people that don't like prisoners. There's some people that don't like preachers. You know what, you know what Publius did? He said, I'm just going to receive them all. And here's what he did. Look at it. Look at your Bible. I, I'm amazed. And lodged us. It looks like he gave him a place to stay. How many of you would appreciate if somebody gave you a free place to stay? How many of you would appreciate if somebody gave you a free place to stay after you'd been swimming in the sea, after you'd been on a ship for 14 days, thought you were going to die, and you crawl, crawl onto the sand, and this rich guy says, I tell you what, how about, won't you just come over to my place? I'm going to just put you up for three days. Good man or bad man? Oh, we like him. Oh, yeah. That Publius, I tell you right now, that guy, he opened up his house. I'm saying that Publius, this wealthy man, he's receiving these men. And when I say that, now listen to me, God is interested in those of, of, of merit and position. But when it says the chief man received us, listen to me, God is interested in all 276 souls as well. I'm here to tell you, Jesus didn't come to save those that were wealthy and educated. Jesus came to save all men, whosoever is who he came for. No, say something about that. When it says that a barbarian received us, that a wealthy barbarian received us, he's talking about all, all those men. It doesn't say he segregated the prisoners over here, which you perhaps and I perhaps would have done. He didn't say he pushed the preachers over to this side. What he did is he brought them all there. And I'm going to say this morning, I'm glad I can say it. The Bible is very clear. God, God is not a respecter of a man's skin color or a man's economic status. The Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ died for all men. Yeah. People talking about what we need in this country. I tell you what we need in this country. We need Jesus Christ in the heart of every man is what we need. Jesus Christ walks in the places that we would call slums and projects, but he also walks in the finest neighborhoods. He walks in countries where people have brown skin and black skin and yellow skin and white skin, and he doesn't make any bones about going there. I'm telling you right now, we have a Savior who's interested in all men. You say, why does that make a difference? That means that you and I get in on that. I'm glad he's interested in Southerners. Some people aren't. They don't like what we eat. They don't like what we drink. They don't like the way we talk. I've had people say to me before, where are you from? <laughs> I say, why do you ask? Well, you must be from either Alabama or Georgia. Well, if I got it written on my head somewhere, I don't know. I... Well, you talk like a southerner. You know what? God doesn't sit in heaven and say, those are north of the Mason-Dixon line. I don't care anything about them. Those are south of Mason-Dixon line. You know what? The Bible is clear that God so loved the world. You want an example of impartiality? You want an example of someone who embraces a world? It, listen, it, it is not some, some group out there that is touting themselves. I'm going to tell you who it is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I look at this passage, the multitude is made up of a chief man, but it's also made up of all men. Amen. And then I look down what else it says about this man. It says that in verse number 7 that he lodged us three days. And there's another little word right there. Could you read it with me? What's the last word in verse 7 in your Bible? Could you read it with me? What does it say? Courteously. That's a rich barbarian and he's courteous. You know, that word only occurs three times in your Bible. 
Here, it's a barbarian that's of note. In chapter 27, go back and look there, verse number 3, and the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul. That's a soldier, a centurion. Now, most people would say, Roman centurion, probably lost. Barbarian, probably lost. And yet, both men are courteous. And when I looked up the definition of courteous, courteous means mannerly. How many of you think we ought to have manners? Respect. How many of you think we ought to respect all people? Yeah. Polite, civil. That's what, the, that's what the word means. So we got a Roman centurion that is courteously treating Paul, and then we've got a, a, a chief barbarian who is courteously treating 276 men. Look at the third time. This is amazing me. Third time. First Peter, go if you would there just a moment. I know we're turning a little bit in the Bible today. That'd be all right. First Peter, I believe, on chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, third time that you find the word courteous in the Bible. Verse number 8, finally, be ye all of one kind, of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So you know what that says? Born again believers ought to be courteous. Now, come on now. <laughs> if a Roman centurion can be courteous and a barbarian cheap man can be courteous, don't you think born-again believers ought to be courteous? Amen. 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 Civil, polite, respectful. You know, that's something that we don't see right now in the world in which we live, and it's a shame. I think everybody ought to be treated with respect. That's right. I, I don't think somebody else ought to change that. I understand defending your own personal property and your own personal uh, family and, and all of that, but this man is being a courteous man, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you it's going to pay dividends later on. So we see chief men in this multitude. We see all men in this multitude. Then verse number 8, look what this says. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now we see the family of another man, a man's family. How many of you think that children are a gift from God? Would you say amen to that? My dad, my dad turns 80 on Tuesday. He'll be 80 years old. I'm, I'm going to go home and I'm going gonna to give him a birthday party. And uh, I, I, I appreciate my dad and his investment in my life, the example that he gave me. Parkinson has changed much of his ability to live the way he used to live, but he's still my daddy. And I appreciate, I appreciate the dad that God gave me. And this man, this man Publius, he has a, a dad who's sick. And it doesn't say that he went to Paul, it doesn't tell us, but what it does say, it says it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux. When you, when you read that in your Bible, and I, it's amazing to me now, when you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, he lay sick of a fever of a bloody flux. A doctor is writing this. Luke is the man that God used to write the book of Acts. He's a physician. A bloody flux is something that, a flux is a flow. So it, this man is bleeding. All right, he's bleeding. And it says that he has a fever. The fever that you find in the New Testament, you find it with two people. You find it with Peter's mother-in-law, and you find it with a nobleman's son. And the nobleman's son is to be at the point of death. And that's why when it says that he's laying sick of a fever, in my mind, in my mind, published daddy is dying. He's dying. Now, it doesn't tell us how old he is. We don't know how old Publius is. He could be in his 50s, could be in his 60s, could be in his 70s. But he's, he's got a fever, he's hemorrhaging, and he's in the bed. And Paul, Paul does something to affect change in that man's life. And when I begin to think about that, I'm glad, listen, Jesus often helped family members of other people that requested their help. 
Would you come and help my son? Would you come and help my daughter? She's possessed with the devil. Mary and Martha, if you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. Many times Jesus was going to help the family members of other people. And what I'd like to say is this. The multitude has all kind of people. It has chief people in it. It has people that are, that are from all sorts of race, all sorts of, of economic status. But then there are people that have family members that they are dear. That look, whether they're Mormon, whether they're Baha'i, whether it doesn't matter what country they're from, they have family members that they love and they care for. And Publius' daddy is in that point. And Paul, look what he does. Now look, look what he does. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Amen. Paul took some risk, didn't he? Now, come on, think about that for a minute. Today, <laughs> I have to be honest, the first Sunday we met back in here as a church with all the rows spaced out, and I'm standing right there, my throat was just, I, I, I wanted to, I had to cough so bad I could not, I couldn't stand it. And I took some water, and it, it didn't help. And, I'm, and, and here's what I knew. We're all back in here, and I knew if I did this, <coughs> I, in my mind, I pictured about half the congregation getting up and just running out the door. <laughs> and, don't, and listen, and don't be pious, because I guarantee you, somebody sneezes, somebody coughs. I mean, we live in a day-to-day that, that that is almost a crime. And we understand why. Paul takes a risk. He enters into a man's house that has a bloody flux and fever. How many of you think that's pretty risky? Amen. And then you know what else he does? He takes and he touches him. You know, around here lately, we've been doing like this a lot. We've been doing a lot of this, been doing that, you know. I, I did some fist bumping with some of the kids and then read, well, that, that's bad to you. You're supposed to do this or whatever. And I don't know what he's got. We don't know what Publius has, but he's sick, or his father. And Paul enters in and he puts his hand on him. He lays his hands on him. That's a risk. You know, sometimes to reach the, reach the multitude, we're going to have to take some risks. You know, I think somebody would say, well, preacher, we understand you've got to take risks like they're doing over in China to get the gospel in. You're right, that's a risk. Or we got to go into a neighborhood that's really just kind of a, a very dangerous neighborhood. You're right, that may be a risk. Or you maybe have to risk your reputation. I'm going to talk to my doctor. I'm going to talk to this lawyer. And he might make fun of me. He might say something negative to me. You know what? All those things come with risk. But Paul's not worried about the risk. He's worrying about doing something to repay the kindness that was shown him. And the reason I say that is he prayed over him. He prayed over him and he healed him. And I believe the re reason he did it, look, these barbarous people showed no little kindness, verse 2. They kindled a fire. And here in verse number 7, this chief man's possessions are being distributed. Later on in verse number 10, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Paul is returning the kindness. And in my mind, in my mind, I've read it a hundred times, and today, first time today, thinking about it, Romans 1, 14, Paul says, I am a debtor both to the barbarian and to the Greek. And I know what I've done with that doctrinally. Paul is saying, look, I'm a debtor to every man. I, I, I am a debtor to the gospel should be preached to the Gentile, the Jew first and the Gentile. But Romans, 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 a book to the Romans, and Paul on an island with barbarians, he's saying, I want to repay the kindness to this man. He's been good to me, so I want to try to help his dad. I'm going to take the risk. And let me ask you this. If somebody opened their home for three days to you, after you'd been shipwrecked and after you'd been on a stormy sea for a whole two weeks, wouldn't you send a thank you note for that? Amen. Come on, you're not thinking. Wouldn't you say thank you for that? Amen. Maybe you'd bake them some cookies or you'd do something. And Paul, I think, is repaying the kindness. And so when I said something about being courteous, when I talk about that we ought to love one another, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, what the Bible says, I think, are you listening? Are you, you get what you give. I believe, Dan, do you love me? So if I say, man, Dan, I love you. How are you doing? And I reach in my pocket and I pull out some money and I give it to you. Does that make you feel good? All right. And then, then somewhere down the road, he reciprocates. You remember when we went to go to the apple place? You remember that? Yes, Didn't you buy my family some apples? You sure did. And we, that reciprocated. So we're just being kind to one another. But you know, it works in a lot of other ways too. 
If I'm sharp with you, stand up just a minute. Weren't you a drill? Weren't you a DI? No, sir. You were, you were in the Army, though, weren't you? Yes sir. yes, sir. So if I just get a little bit sharp with you and say, man, you're a pain in the neck sometimes. You know that? Yes, sir. Now, he's saying, yes, sir, but I'm telling you, there's something else down inside of Dan Eshman that I know down in there. Where are you from? Where are you from? South of the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> Maryland. They don't know where that is. Maryland. Yeah, Maryland. You from Maryland? Yes, sir. Oh, that's B Baltimore, Maryland, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, but I tell you what, I'd probably rather be from Antarctica than be from Maryland. Do you think if I said that enough to him, what do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to get sharp with me? You think he's going to remember that? I think he'll probably remember from this day that I said I'd rather be from Antarctica than be from Maryland. That's not really true. <laughs> I'd rather be from Maryland than Antarctica. Hey, here's what we do. And that's why. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. It is, abs listen, it is absolutely absurd and mentally crazy to think that by going out and busting things down and burning things and screaming at people and accosting people that are wearing a uniform and putting them in the category of everybody else and doing all that and not to think there's going to be pushed back the other way. Listen, you are never, never, ever going to be able to reach a place of any kind of civility like that. And that's why I think as believers, we ought to be kind to each other. How many of you agree with everything? Let's, let's try it this way. How many of you men agree with everything that your wife believes and does? Can I see your hand? Robbie's the only smart man in the building. <laughs> I do. I do. How many of you would lie in church? <laughs> smart man. You know what? We disagree with our spouses. We disagree with our pastor. You're gonna, I know people that disagree with the choices that I've made during this time. I've not agreed with everything that I've done during this time. But then we can do it two different ways. Well, I don't like what you did. You, I didn't get, listen, I didn't get to sit in the seat I've been sitting in for 40 years because of you. You roped off my seat. <laughs> and you can act like that ain't been said, but I know it's been said. I know it. And we take it and we make it personal. And, and what happens is, you're not like me. This guy, maybe he has a little bit different standard than I have. Or this person has a different conviction than I have. Or this person has a different uh, a taste of music than I have. And again, I'm trying to keep it in parameters. We ought to like godly music, live godly lives. But we're going to be different. We're going to make different choices. And you know what we ought to do? Are you li we ought to treat people with respect and kindness. Amen. Amen. Right. I think I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind. <laughs> that makes me want to say something very unkind when I hear somebody say, I just want to give you a piece of my mind. You might need your mind. <laughs> you might not have very many pieces. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, you give somebody a piece of your mind, you know what you're liable to get back? A whole pie. That doesn't belong in a church. That doesn't belong in a family. That doesn't belong in a society. That's not who we are. And what I'm saying is Paul is giving an example of returning kindness to a man that he just met. This is not somebody he has some kind of connection to. It's a man in need. And Paul has an apostolic gift. Now, I, I don't have time to, to preach that this morning. My time is already away from me. But it says he laid hands on him. If you would out beside that in your Bible there in verse number 8, write, write Acts 19, verse 6 and verse 11. Paul, his hands like Jesus' hands, had a power in it that I do not have. Now, I can pray over a man. I can enter into that house and be kind to a man, and I think I should. But I do not have the power to heal a man. I do not have the power by the laying on of my hands a gift that was given to the apostles for the confirmation of the unwritten word. And I'm not going to go into it this morning, but in Mark chapter 16 and in Hebrews chapter 4 and in Exodus chapter 3, God would give a sign to confirm what was not written. 
You say, do you believe in faith healers? Absolutely not. But do you believe in a God that heals people? Absolutely. I'm telling my daughter, I don't know where Hannah is here this morning, but my daughter, I know what the, the imaging said about the tumor in my daughter's back as a baby. I know what the doctor told me. I know the images that I saw and the surgery that followed. And then I also know when he came in and he showed me, here's the tumor, here's your daughter's spine. And I can't explain that. Well, you know what? I can. There's a miracle working God in heaven. As a little boy, I remember seeing my pastor's wife weep over the death of her son in Vietnam and then see all of our ladies gather around and weep over her because she had cancer. And I can still remember the testimony how that she said, I'm done with this. And she had that beehive hairdo and she'd get it done every Friday and she was losing her hair and she said, Lamar, I'm not going back to the doctor. You call for the elders of the church. And I remember, I didn't understand it all, but they prayed over her and God, God took. And when she went back to that doctor and they looked over her up and down, Miss Engel, we need a couple more hours. We can't figure out what's going on. And they came back and told a woman who was eaten up with cancer that they couldn't find it anywhere. And that didn't come from some guy that passed an offering plate. That came from a God in heaven who has power to do all things. Hallelujah. I don't have that power. And I'm going to tell you what, if I did have that power, Amen. I'd be at the children's hospital. My state wouldn't have to worry, the city of Green wouldn't have to worry about coronavirus. I'd just take care of all of that. That's what upsets me about these people. Look, Publius's father, we don't know anything about him, but he's a barbarian. It doesn't say that he had faith. It doesn't say he asked to be healed. It just said that Paul took an apostolic gift and healed him, and he returned the kindness. So when somebody says, you just need to have more faith, I agree, but you don't need to have more faith in their power. You need to have more faith in what God does in people. He's interested in the multitude. Amen. Last thing I won't mention this morning, I'm, I'm finished. In verse number 9, he said, So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Can I ask you a question? How many of you think Publius got excited when he found out his daddy was healed? How many of you think daddy got excited when he was healed? Oh, Brother, brother Melvin, he, he tickled me. He's been looking at me without glasses. It's kind of hard to preach to him that way because he's had them on now since I've been here. And he had cataract surgery done. And, man, he told me he could see. And, boy, he goes out saying, well, glory. And then this morning he stopped me right there and he took his finger and put it in the other eye. He said, surgery this coming Monday on this eye. <laughs> Next thing we know, Brother, brother Vaughn's going to say, I believe I'm going back to Brazil. Y'all go ahead and raise up some money. I'm headed out. <laughs> Excited. Don't you think this man was excited about his dad being healed and this man was excited? You know, I've seen people, I've watched, and, and Brother Randy, I know he'll be upset at me. Brother Randy Morgan, Brother Randy Morgan got born again as a deacon. I'm telling you right now, God's changed Randy Morgan's life. I've seen Brother Steve Asbel come in and talk about how he got born again. God's changed his life. Changed his life. And other people get excited about it. And notice it says, so then others also. These are sick people. Look what it said, which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Now, I, I want you, if you would, that, that word disease, the Bible says that Christ came not to heal the righteous, but the sick. He came looking for the sick. He came looking for people. Listen to me. He came looking for people that have addiction problems, marital problems, mental problems. He came looking for people that were at the bottom of the pit that had filth not just on the outside, but that was all covered on the inside. I'm talking about sin taking and wrapping its fingers all through the soul to the place to where there's no light, there's no hope, just like those men out there on that ship. But I'm telling you, there is a Savior that knows how to take somebody from the bottom of a pit whose life is filled through and through with guilt and shame and sin. He knows how to take and pull them out of that pit, put a new creature on the inside, and send them on their way with His glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, I'm preaching to some people this morning. If you, if you took the time to stand up today, and tell what you used to be, 
Wouldn't some of you stand up and say, boy, preacher, I used to hate church and hate the Bible, used to run from God, and now this morning, <laughs> this morning, you got a Bible open in your lap, you're sitting on a pew inside of a church house, and God has done something in your life. I'm telling you, there's a miracle work in God for sick people. See, Paul went from encouraging those men on a ship, and now he's encouraging barbarians on an island. I'm jealous. Where he was, there's joy on the ship now, and now there's joy on the island. And I'm telling you, these men, if you look at there in verse number 10, who honored us with many honors, those soldiers, those sailors, those prisoners, they're watching people bring clothes, and they're watching people bring food, and they're watching people shake Paul's hand and say, boy, we're so glad you got shipwrecked on this island. My mom's never been better. My child's never been better. And I think those men are standing back, and they're looking and saying, my goodness, what? What kind of man is this? You know, the better question isn't what kind of man was Paul, but what kind of God did Paul have to offer the world? Wasn't the power of positive thinking and how to survive shipwreck? It was a God in heaven that made the difference. I think they just sat back and said, wow. Wow. I sit this morning and I look at this passage and I just say, Wow. If I could take that and walk through the streets of Washington, D.C., and Chicago, Illinois, and Minneapolis, the difference that Jesus could make, it makes me want to be able just to grab a bunch of people and say, hey, let's just go out there and shake off the viper in the fire and not worry about the cold and not worry about the rejection. Let's just see what we can do in the middle of a multitude. Paul, Paul was interested in the multitude, and so was our God. Our God, our God is interested in all men, in chief men, and in sick men. And if you've got family members that are sick, and I'm talking about eating up with sickness, I, I'll never forget a letter that was put on a, a little wooden pulpit we had underneath a tent. And on that letter on the outside, I kept it. It said, please help me. And this lady told the story about her husband who was involved in drugs and split her home and, and ran after other women. And she just kept saying, this is not what I want. And you could, you could hear the tears. She wanted help. Please help me. I'm glad I got a God knows how to help. Some of you have family members. They're sick. Some of you live in a neighborhood, the people you live in, you know what? Their, their car may be nice and their house be nice. They still got something on the inside that needs God's help. And all I'm just saying today is God's interested in the multitude. I think we're being turned in so many different ways. We're turned against the multitude, hate the multitude. No, Jesus loved the multitude. He loved the multitude. Would you stand to your feet?